welcoming you to the 23rd uh, RISIS Research Seminar, which will be presented by myself uh, uh, based on work with co authors, uh, Lutz Borman, who is also here. So thank you, Lutz, for attending. And uh, Felix uh, de Moya Negon from uh, Chimago. Uh, and so I would like to welcome Wolfgang Glenzer, who gladly accepted to act as a discussant, a very experienced discussant on, on, this, on these matters. I just remind you the rules of the game. Uh, please mute yourself when you are not talking. Uh, you can ask questions also during the presentations. Uh, you can do it in the chat, you can intervene directly. Uh, you are just asked to open your camera when you want to, uh, to intervene so that we get some faces also behind, uh, behind the questions. And uh, it will be the useful, the usual way of doing. So I'll present uh, uh, the paper. Uh, and then I'll give the word uh, to uh, Volkang for his rejoinder and uh, critical comments. Uh, and then we will open, uh, have an open discussion uh, and question and answer. Uh, so thank you. If there are no introductory questions, I'll share my screen uh, so that I can present. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So what I'll present is a joint paper with uh, Lutz Bormann from uh, Max Planck in Munich and uh, Felix de Moyanegon from uh, Chimago Group. It's about comparing measure of higher education sites and uh, more specifically comparing academic personnel. I will come into detail later. Academic personnel is uh, a definition which comes directly from official statistics and which is used also in the European Tertiary Education Register versus a measure called scientific talent pool, which is basically the number of publishing author by institution in uh, Scopus. And the goal is to discuss these measures, to compare them, to understand their relationships uh, and to try to understand their usability for uh, uh, the study of higher education institutions. Now, uh, to start by framing the problem, uh, we first have an empirical fact that uh, higher education institutions, even research universities, if we limit uh, only to those, for example, present in bibliometric analysis and rankings, have widely different organizational sites. And widely different means that the uh, uh, largest uh, uh, university in Europe are something like uh, 10 to 15,000 uh, employees, uh, and some institutions have some tens or some hundreds. And we have many small and very few large organizations. Uh, uh, it's a statistical law called uh, Gibras law. The distribution is uh, nearly log normal. So there are few large, and most uh, higher education institutions are reasonably small. This generates a need for uh, having measures of sites for sensible comparisons. If the scale changes too much, uh, uh, you cannot simply compare. And uh, as uh, Abramo and Angelo said in 2016, uh, no serious economist would uh, compare uh, without a measure of sites, uh, companies with 10 employees with companies with 10,000. And uh, they made the argument that even uh, bibliometric indicators, scale free, scale so called scale free, like uh, uh, normalized citation scores, are size dependent. And indeed, in a former paper, we provide evidence of nonlinear scaling of uh, uh, publication output of a size, which means that, that these uh, bibliometric indicators are indeed dependent on, on uh, scale. And uh, it's well known uh, and uh, it has been made the argument many times by econometricians, scientometricians like my colleague uh, Lutz Bormann, that if you measure efficiency, measure as efficiency is something like a sense of output versus some input. So some measure of size is, is required. Now, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, now, uh, 
The problem is that measure of sites are somewhat difficult and particularly the bibliometric community always considered that uh, these measures are much less comparable and less available than uh, uh, measure, for example, of publication output, citation, etc. In terms of both availability, so coverage of countries of institution, and in terms of comparability. And I think there are good reasons for this. But at the same time, uh, we think that the situation has somewhat improved in the last decades. Uh, also because uh, uh, institutional data system, which were available 20 years ago, are now starting to become available. When I started my academic career, I joined a project by a very imaginific guy called Andrea Bonacosi, who said we need to collect data on individual higher education institutions, data like input, student, etc. And everybody, including me, thought it's uh, impossible. And now we have uh, at least some data. So there is some ground to uh, rediscuss this issue also given its substantive importance. So measures of size of higher education institution might be problematic, but they are so important that it deserves looking closely to their usability. So in the paper, we compare the two, two measures which are widely available. One is academic personnel. Academic personnel, I, I will come later, is defined by organizational educational statistics by uh, UNESCO, uh, Eurostat, and OECD. And data are collected uh, by various institutional data systems, including ATER in Europe, IPEDS in the US, etc. And then a measure which has been proposed by the Shimago team is called scientific talent pool as the number of authors affiliated to an institution in Scopus. And uh, we use a large population of higher education institutions from the European Tertiary Education Register, uh, basically the role of uh, publishing institutions in Europe. So it's, it's, it's really a population, it's not just a sample. And we aim at understanding the sources of differences between these indicators to show they are related but to show also where differences come from, uh, depending on how they are defined, the different sources, et cetera. And in the identifying in a way complementarities, understanding the strength and weakness for different types of analysis. So we have some sense that having two measures which are fully independent in terms of their sources and definitions might help understanding better uh, their content and their value. So I will first uh, uh, present these indicators, academic personnel and STP, uh, look to their definitions and also some methodological problem and try to derive expectation on their relationships. So how we would expect that they are related to each other. I will present you the data and I will present uh, some results on the relationship between AP and STP on outliers, cases where the academic personnel is much larger or much smaller than the scientific talent pool, and then use uh, multivariate statistics, so uh, regression, to uh, uh, analyze their, their relationship. And then I will come to some discussion and conclusions. Now, uh, to go into definition, academic personnel, as said, uh, is uh, defined by official educational statistics. So it's not a definition invented by us uh, or by some scholar. It's uh, standardized by, uh, by Eurostat, by OECD, by UNESCO. So it's an international reference. And the definition is based on the idea of uh, counting personnel employed by an higher education institution. So it's basically the working contract with place uh, involved in the research and or teaching. Um, and I, I, I will not go into very specific delimitation issues, but it's a reference to contractual arrangements. Uh, there is an exclusion of administrative and technical personnel <clears throat> as well, and I'll come back later, so-called research and teaching assistants, so those people who are expected not to do independent research and independent teaching. And there is no breakdown between the research and teaching. It's a whole open, a whole other chapter in this methodological discussion how you could measure the research and teaching share of uh, higher education personnel. 
um, just to make a long story simple here, uh, there is some uh, statistical standards, but the, the measures are very difficult to employ. So uh, in practice, these, are, these data are uh, simply not available. Now, uh, I've been studying within the ATER project for many years, this data we are collecting, and uh, we are aware of many issues affecting comparability between countries. <clears throat> Maybe the first one, the most important one is uh, the definition of perimeter of higher education institutions and of their linkages. <clears throat> While you might think a university is a clear entity and it's clear what is the contractual perimeter, you end up with all kinds of complicated issues like uh, affiliated units, which are legally independent, so the contracts maybe are not counted, uh, even more complicated hospitals. Hospitals have their own personnel. Their personnel is maybe affiliated to the universities, but uh, in most cases, the personnel does not have a hospital personnel, does not have a contract with the university. In some cases, it does. So this is a major source of comparability problem. And I'll comment later, situation becomes even more complicated uh, in cases like France, uh, where some units, some research groups are shared between universities and public research organizations like CNRS. So half of the personnel of a research unit might have a contract with the university and half with the CNRS, for example. <clears throat> so these are uh, general problem. Uh, of course, there are also issues uh, uh, on multi-level structures, uh, uh, consortia of institutions, uh, and there are issues with uh, ancillary services, uh, um, but these issues uh, are more severe in the US than in Europe. In the US, there is a whole story you need to exclude, for example, the food uh, foot, football club uh, and uh, all these kind of activities, uh, because this might strongly impact on uh, um, counting of uh, academic personnel, but that's not a, a, a very severe issue in Europe. The second issue is coverage of PhD students. Uh, statistical definitions are um, not clear about whether a, a PhD student should be considered as academic personnel doing inter-independent research or as research and teaching assistant and excluded from academic personnel. And to make things worse, uh, data on research and teaching assistance are not collected by Eurostat. So until ATER started to collect this data, we did not know. And there is an ongoing uh, um, methodological debate within OECD and Eurostat uh, on how to solve this issue, since we know that uh, some of, in some European countries, PhD students are in the academic personnel, in some countries are not. And this generates obvious comparability problems. The other issue is counting of personnel. Uh, you can count people in two ways. One is uh, by head counts, uh, one person counts one, and the second one is full-time equivalent. So the average working time over the year. Now, <clears throat> uh, we know from the work we did in ATER that head counts, which are the preferred measure also in official statistics, are somewhat fragile. On the one hand, uh, uh, not all institutions keep track of people employed by a few percent, uh, and this might affect comparability. Uh, it might not be an issue for universities, but it might be an issue, for example, for colleges with a large number of external teachers. Um, Headcounts depend a lot on reference dates. So uh, in Switzerland, we had uh, um, a situation where headcounts were counted from people having a, a contract during the year, then at some point uh, um, the, the statistical office changed to the official standard, which is people employed the last day of the calendar year. And the number of head counts dropped by 40%, because if somebody had just a contract in June for teaching in one model counting way, it would have been counted as in, in the academic personnel, in the other case, no. So headcounts are more problematic, uh, but uh, on, uh, um, and tend to vary more over time. Now, uh, scientific talent pool, I, to say I'm not a bibliometrician, so my competence on uh, methodological issues might be less pronounced, and 
I, I understood that Wolfgang can help on that. But it's defined as the number of author identifying Scopus affiliated with an institution. Many of you will know that Scopus has unique author identifiers, so you can count uh, uh, the number of people. So in principle available for an institution covered by Scopus worldwide. There is no uh, issue like geography, like Ether is only Europe, iPads is only US, etc. But there are several methodological issues in counting. One is hom on, uh, homonymies, of course, people with the same name, uh, but uh, different authors, changes in author names. Maybe more seriously, guest scientists with no contractual relationship. And I, I will show you some cases. And of course, if somebody is not, pub not publishing in Scopus, uh, either because he or she is publishing in areas not covered by Scopus or because he or she is not doing a research with publishable outputs, he or she will not be counted in uh, STP, of course. So it's uh, the name scientific talent pool means basically the name uh, people publishing in bibliometric databases uh, should be interpreted that way. Now, if we compare, uh, we get some expectations we can test empirically. Uh, of course, we would expect they are correlated. It would be very sad if they would be completely different because they are in a way <laughs> counting people within higher education institutions. So you, you would expect to find them correlated. Uh, STP counts only publishing personnel. So when research intensity of an education institutions is very low, like a art school, a college, etc., the academic personnel should be much larger than STP. Uh, and when research intensity is high, you expect that STP becomes uh, uh, as large or even larger than academic personnel, also because academic personnel does not necessarily count the PhD students, and in many areas, PhD students do publish, so they may be counted by STP. Uh, Scopus, like every bibliometric database, covers better sciences and maybe social sciences, but not humanities, so we expect uh, 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 subject mix uh, effect uh, and uh, for higher education institution specialized in social sciences and even more in humanities, we expect uh, academic person is, is larger than STP. We expect STP becomes larger when there is a university hospital, because in most cases, uh, people will be affiliated to the university, but not having a contract in, at the university because they are employees of the hospital. And we expect the same when there are associated centers, which are part of the academic perimeter. Of course, for authors having a university affiliation may be a bonus and uh, everybody will strive to have an academic title, academic affiliation, but people in these centers may not be under contractual relationship with the university, so academic personnel will be lower. Now, as I will show you, we can test this uh, with some uh, proxies or covariates of, uh, um, of higher education institution. Now, data, we start from the European Tertiary Education Register and we made a match with Chimago Institution rankings uh, names. Uh, almost all SEER uh, entities can be matched with Ether. There are something like 100 uh, or 50 not matched. And the match entities, if we compare to Ether, you might know Ether as a very complete coverage of uh, higher education or tertiary education in Europe. Uh, we get 80% of bachelor or master students and 94% of PhD students. So even if uh, these 1,500 entities are only half of the institutions in Ether, this is the core of European higher education. So in, in, that, in that respect, we are really covering uh, extensively uh, the population. Uh, the variables we use, uh, the academic personnel in headcount, uh, uh, we made tests with full-time equivalent as well. Statistical results are not very different. Uh, the STP measure, then we use a measure of research intensity, which is more or less standard in higher education, is the number of PhD versus under the number of undergraduate students. So which tends to be much larger when the institution uh, is more research oriented. It's highly correlated with bibliometric output. 
Uh, we have a measure of legal status, public and private. Uh, I can comment on detail, but it's not the place. We have a measure of awarding a PhD institution legally. And we have a dummy variable uh, for the presence or absence of a universal hospital. This was thanks to cooperation to CWTS, uh, who identify uh, university hospitals in, in, in Europe in a systematic way. Methods, descriptive statistics. Uh, we have something like 1,200 institutions for which we have both measures because academic personal data are not available for all uh, ATER institutions. We look uh, to the data by country and we look to outliers and outliers with STP much larger than academic personnel. The baseline that academic personnel should be larger than scientific talent pool, and we look to the extreme. Of course, we will have the other way around the institutions with much more academic personnel than scientific talent pool, but this may be explained simply by low research activity. So in, in a way, these are not real outliers. These cases deserve closer uh, scrutiny. And then we run a regression model uh, on a log log, uh, as I told you, distribution of sites measure is nearly log normal. So when you transform, you get uh, acceptable statistical distributions, uh, uh, including research intensity, square rooted, just to reduce the influence of uh, outliers, uh, orientation towards uh, the percentage of students in uh, 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 natural and technical science, legal status, PhD award in the university hospital. And then in the full model, we include the country dummies, uh, since we will see there are some reasons to think that the academic personal measure uh, differ systematically by country. So this corrects for national structures and national uh, problems. Uh, we tested model with full-time equivalent. We tested the model with uh, um, random intercept, uh, so multi-level with uh, country level, and results are very similar. So I will not comment further in this presentation. Now, descriptive statistics, uh, they in, uh, when we have the data, the sum of STP is 76% the sum of academic personnel, which is encouraging. You would expect it's smaller. Uh, and this is what you get. Uh, if you make correlation, you get uh, uh, fairly high correlations uh, between STP and academic personnel and with research intensity and with the orientation to science and technology. So it's what you expect. Uh, I want to say uh, to, to have uh, that academic personnel is correlated to 0 0.8 to STP is large an outcome that the two vary hugely by size. So in a way, uh, since there are three or four orders of magnitude, uh, two measures can be highly correlated, but nevertheless uh, be very different at the individual institution level. So it's a good sign, but does not say much about predictability of the two. Now, uh, if we look to the country, this is uh, STP divided by academic personnel by country. And uh, you see most countries are below one, which is what you expect. Uh, you see a patterns uh, you would expect that the uh, most uh, Central and Eastern European countries have lower ratios, which is reasonable since they tend to, have to be less strong scientifically. So you would expect to go low. And then you, you find some cases where STP is larger than academic personnel, and one is France. And our explanation is that uh, uh, most of the university research in France is done in joint research units with CNRS, with uh, uh, INRIA, et cetera. And STP is counting all the personnel in these units because all of them will have the joint affiliation, for example, CNRS University but only a share of them is employed contractually by the university. So you would expect this effect. Uh, as for example, Italy, uh, we know that uh, the ATER data on academic personnel include only structured staff. Uh, so basically professors plus some. So the values as compared with other countries are probably uh, underestimated. Uh, so we get, uh, um, reasonable result in the sense we can explain and we can start understanding the effect of uh, 
some of the factors we observe before. Uh, it's interesting to look at the outliers. So that's uh, the case is with uh, STP divided AP, which is much larger. Basically, we have 80 cases where STP is more than the double of academic personnel. Most of them are in France and in Italy, and this relates to the structural reasons. Uh, the other cases can be uh, explained by special conditions. So look, for example, to Campus Biomedico in Rome. Uh, it's a rather small medical university associated with a very large hospital. So you would expect these effects. Um, the same some French uh, institute like uh, uh, Toulouse as large uh, associated research institutes, which are managed by within CNRS or within other public research organizations. Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa is a graduate school. So they have very many teachers affiliated to them and maybe publishing also with their affiliation, but most of them are probably not under contract with the Scuola Normale. Uh, the University Center in Svalbard, it's an Arctic Research Center. They host research from all the world, and clearly they exchange price for hosting research is that they put the affiliation of that center. Uh, Erasmus University Rotterdam, you see, is the medical center, which accounts for most of the authors. So uh, the message and, uh, is that in most cases, you can explain these outliers by looking more carefully to the institutional structure. In some cases, you know that the result, the data are wrong. For example, uh, the case in Poland, uh, in uh, Stetsin, uh, the year we used in ether is simply mistaken. So we look into the data, there is a mistake. Uh, we know that Belgian, French speaking university have underestimated values, etc. So few cases may be explained by data problem. And we have some suspect cases indeed also on STP, but uh, I'm I'm less able to, to comment on them. Now, uh, the regression. So the first one is the simple model, just uh, um, STP academic personnel, and you got the uh, air square of 0 0.6, but the air square increased quite strongly when you add uh, the covariates, which is what you would expect uh, since we are, they are measuring different things, uh, and uh, still improves a little little bit when adding uh, country dummies, uh, but the, the change is not so, uh, so big. And you see research intensity as a strong uh, positive and significant coefficients, which is uh, what we expected. Legal status is not significant. Orientation towards science and technology is significant. And uh, the PhD awarding is not significant, but the, there are relatively few non-PhD awarding institutions in the sample. And the hospital is highly significant, where a positive coefficient means uh, with the same level of academic personnel, you get a higher STP uh, in, by, for, for the university. So in a way, that's good in the sense this, uh, uh, this is what we expected, and we, we get a strong improvement of the fit. What we also did is to try to predict STP from the regression saying we know the academic personnel of a university and we predict uh, STP and we compare with the data observed. Uh, and you see there is quite a good fit with some issues we, we might uh, examine for some of the largest days. And also, which is uh, reassuring, the fit is, is reasonably good along the whole size dimension. It's not that the fit is very good for the small institution, it's very bad for the large one, for example. So result in this respect are reassuring. When you have one measure plus the coverage, you can predict the other measure in an acceptable and re statistically reliable way without excluding uh, um, problem cases. So I'm coming to some discussion and uh, some conclusions. So first, to restate, reliable size measure are essential for institutional comparison. We cannot avoid this discussion and this uh, work. And uh, as I told to Wolfram before, um, rankings are starting to use the size measures. 
uh, as an appendix to say we, we you can take into account size. So it, it's something coming and it's something we have to uh, discuss to improve the measure and to understand what they give. Results are still, overall are reassuring. So my first uh, take home is that uh, uh, when we started comparing the two measure and the relationship, we had no sign that uh, uh, AP data or STP data are completely wrong. So we don't, if we had observed no relationships at all, this would have cast doubt on both measures in a way. So in a way that's reassuring that at least uh, in a statistical sense that the patterns are uh, reasonably stable. And I'm very careful to say in a statistical sense, but it should have been clear from the analysis of outlier. This is not exclude that individual data points are biased. But when you work uh, uh, on a large sample, statistically the data makes sense. Uh, beyond that, the cases where we find the strong deviations are related to structural reasons, we know they should be controlled for. So I think it's very clear, for example, that uh, controlling for the existence of a university hospital, it's something which has to be done uh, anyway for any kind of comparative analysis. Uh, we get a sense that STP provides a better measure of scientific potential of higher education institutions because it goes past uh, contractual issues or legal status issues like hospitals being within the university or outside, uh, or units uh, uh, like the joint uh, units in France, which are divided contractually between different uh, institutions. So in a way, it's less uh, affected by these kind of issues. But of course, it becomes very problematic uh, when uh, you consider efficiency and you have to take into account also teaching activities, uh, third mission activities, and you need to uh, work in a multi-output setting. And of course, uh, it becomes very problematic for non-research oriented higher education institutions. So beyond the, 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 the core of uh, research universities. And of course, when there is a strong focus on social science in the special humanities. So I would never use STP for art schools for comparing sites because it's very problematic. Uh, and the availability of both indicators, which is given in Europe, which is given in the US uh, from IPEDS, uh, it's important because you can develop this kind of uh, comparative works, uh, cross-checking, and this might allow also finding out data problems, and maybe constructing combined indicators. So one direction we might move in the future is to think uh, whether we could combine these two measures in something which is more robust because it goes past uh, the problems of uh, both indicators. That's what I wanted to present. So I'll stop sharing and I give the word to Wolfgang. Yes, thank you very much, Benedetto. Yes, first I share my presentation. Um, I have some comments. Can you see it? Not yet, but now? Yes. Okay. So, yes, I have some comments on uh, this comparative study by uh, uh, Lepori et al. And in the first place, I would like uh, to congratulate uh, the three authors to their excellent and great job they have done. Um, and uh, of course, this uh, paper presented right now provokes some uh, uh, some discussion. Um, so I would not like uh, to um, reflect too much on the statistical analysis, which is otherwise uh, fine and uh, correct. Um, it's more the whole package uh, around uh, this uh, study, including uh, yeah, data collection, uh, reprocessing, data processing, quantification, and so on that uh, is, uh, so to speak, the environment in which uh, finally the study could be um, embedded. And this refers for us more to the scientific talent pool. Um, so to begin with, um, um, 
the academic personnel stands for a conservative method that provides a direct quantitative approach um, to the higher education size in terms of uh, personnel. It's trivial, it's obvious. So it's just to, to um, define the criteria what one considers uh, academic personnel and how to count it. So STP as such is much more complex. It is an indirect measure of uh, personnel because um, it starts uh, from the output of uh, academic stuff. So the author's affiliations are determined on the basis of the corporate address uh, that have been found in the bibliographic data of the publications of the academic stuff. And uh, this goes with uh, a lot of challenges. Of course, uh, the authors, uh, the other names have to be disambiguated um, uh, to allow a counting of a head counting. FTP, FTE counting is even more complex here in this. Um, 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 and of course, also the institution has to be disambiguated, the institution name as well as found in uh, the uh, database because. Um, the institutional information in the database is far from being uh, standardized. So it's really already a big job to do that, to determine a proxy for academic stuff on the basis of um, its outputs in the database as found in the database, okay? So both approaches of, are um, prone to possible errors and uh, comparability issues. So um, of course, um, I pointed already to the problem with uh, um, determining the academic stuff on the basis of uh, the Scopus database, but, uh, or other bibliographic databases as well, but uh, there are also possible errors or compatibility um, um, uh, problems uh, with the AP, of course. In general, uh, the main issues are organizational and national peculiarities, the joint research institutes as mentioned by uh, Benedetto and the governmental public, be it a governmental or public, and the presence of absence or absence of uh, university hospitals. And um, this is not only a question in general, there are also changes. Huh? So we have to keep in mind that there was a structure, a structural change in the um, uh, academic landscape in, in Ireland in the uh, second half of the 90s, or um, keep in mind the change in, in Austria in 2003, when uh, most uh, of the university hospitals have become independent medical universities. So this um, picture might change over time. So it does not mean once determined, it's valid forever. Um, research and teaching profiles are heavily affecting higher education size as well. I come to that a bit later. Um, research and teaching profiles um, does not only um, uh, imply uh, that by subject orientation, but also structural issues. Okay, so um, in the study, a large data set of European uh, higher education in this institution, almost uh, 1,200 have been selected. That is quite a lot. Uh, and both measures have been compared in the um, um, on the basis of a regression analysis to which I come also a bit later. Now, so for the academic personal part, ITER database was used, uh, was mentioned, and um, it covers a standardized data set at the European level. And here uh, it is also, it applies a limitation because we cannot go outside Europe with that. We cannot allow for an inter-global um, comparison or global benchmarking. So um, it is restricted to Europe. As such, it's not a problem. If you stay within Europe, it's a fine database. Um, not so STP, which is strongly research-oriented, but STP is based on the global database. Huh? It's a global multidisciplinary database and STP has a potential to extend uh, this kind of research of um, uh, or this kind of um, uh, higher education size determination uh, even outside Europe. Um, and that is one already one of the potentials I would like to stress here. Um, 
just uh, to mention that uh, data have been based on a match of ETA database uh, with the Margo institutions um, ranking database because other matching uh, models are also possible. It can be man, uh, matched by, by academic personnel itself on an individual level uh, to have a more fine-grained uh, approach and also to, to check um, uh, what is uh, missing in the database, who actually is missing in the database and who not. But it's done on an institutional level, which is fine for this kind of study. So, and Benedetto already mentioned that uh, several issues um, which with um, uh, the STP approach was faced uh, when determining um, uh, the uh, researchers' affiliations. It's, uh, of course, the homonyms, um, the synonyms. And synonyms is not only uh, other change. It's also uh, spelling variances of other names, the same others. Um, and uh, this has to do with uh, it might be uh, other name change, but it's also the use of by others in their publications. And uh, in countries uh, where others uh, have uh, double, triple names, um, where it is very frequent, sometimes others are uh, using their names uh, arbitrarily, and uh, it's very hard to decide if uh, the two spelling variances cover the same other name or not. Guest affiliations were uh, mentioned because that's really a problem. You do not know if uh, an affiliation is really covering also employment. Uh, very often, or sometimes it's not. I come back to this issue uh, again later on. And of course, uh, that's by definition, you can only see uh, the output of publishing others. That means uh, academic stuff who is not publishing or is not publishing papers indexed in the database are uh, invisible and are ignored. Um, so all these uh, um, issues have been properly mentioned in the study, that is fine. But of course, this uh, gives also the possibility to think a bit more about that and how to remedy uh, issues that are arising from these um, uh, things. Um, there are some further issues I would like to mention in um, connection with STP. Mm, the definition and determination of stuff, there's no distinction between part-time and full-time employment, of course not. We cannot see, we just see if somebody is publishing or not. We do not know if the author is uh, a full-time employee or has a full-time time job um, at that affiliation or not, um, maybe even retired. The phenomenon of multiple affiliations is, is a very, has become a very strong issue that an author um, has multiple affiliation and you do not know what is covered by that. Not always. Authorship affiliation does not mean employment, as I mentioned already, at least from the data and bibliographic databases. And the delineation of a higher um, um, education institution on the basis of address information is not obvious. It requires really some doing. Um, research requiring a re, um, uh, that requires large resources, staff and equipment, this labs, personnel involved in research may not appear um, through sub-authorship or co-authorship. There was an interesting study by Grit Laudel in 2001, at the time when she was still in Australia. It was a survey-based study from a faculty at the university in Australia. And it turned out that uh, many researchers who are, were involved in research, were employed by the university as researchers, um, were not, they did not appear as uh, sub-authors or co-authors in the publication into which they have contributed. So that's also one thing we have to take in, uh, into account. So the coverage of, um, of, um, of uh, stuff by uh, using this approach is a bit suffering from this as well. It affect, um, uh, yeah, the effect of international collaboration and mobility might, of course, inflate the number of affiliations. Huh? We can discuss that further. It's a very interesting issue that um, we had to study um, uh, jointly with um, my Hungarian colleagues. We have published upon that. We have also used, in addition, the ETA database and also bibliogra bibliometric uh, bibliographic databases 
uh, to trace this kind of uh, uh, effects. So again, to the merits of the study, it was an, a, far, a profound and elaborate analysis uh, from the viewpoint of both data processing and the use statistical models. So the models are fine uh, and it is really uh, correct and um, it uh, assured that the authors could um, obtain meaningful results and statistically significant findings. Uh, uh, but I have to say that the strong collab collaboration between the two measures was a bit unexpected at the first sight. So I have expected a somewhat less or um, lower correlation, weaker correlation. And also the fact that STP uh, reflects 76% uh, uh, um, uh, of IP was a bit, uh, this ratio was a bit high to me. And I'm really happy that uh, this method uh, works so well. But of course, if you have a closer look and uh, the others did, um, then uh, the details have revealed uh, that uh, many of the results were not really unexpected. And for instance, regarding the research intensity and the university profile. So it was really, really encouraging to see that. Um, and the same applies also to the cross country uh, comparison. Um, and I have still some questions concerning the figure in, on slide 11. That is a cross country uh, comparison of the European countries, where I have some questions, still have some questions. So of course, outliers were identified and discussed very well. Uh, that is fine. And um, the, the authors say that there no, was no systematic bias in the comparison of the two measures. And that's also very encouraging, of course. Further strengths of the studies are, of course, um, that the study has revealed issues regarding the depiction, quantification, and measurement pointing to some advantages and disadvantages of ISTP in showing also their, uh, its um, potential. So I mentioned already in the beginning in the outline that uh, there are some issues um, uh, where we have to think about, which might be, um, which requires still some work and improvement. But of course, in the uh, great potential was clearly shown. And I come to that at the end of my uh, comments. Uh, there is one advantage that is unbeatable, I have to say. Okay. So some comments after reading or better after thinking after having read. Um, so we see, and this is actually one of the points is that um, the method can be seamlessly connected with bibliometric tools and be integrated in quantitative science studies in larger context, even on, um, um, on the large scale. So it has everything that can connect academic stuff with publications because that's the way how academic personnel was uh, identified through their publications. And once you have this link, you can easily uh, connect uh, the set of their publication output by individual, by uh, institution. You can link that to the citing papers, to the citation links. You can uh, look at uh, the references and knowledge base of these papers. You can look at collaboration and co-authorship links between institutions and academic staff worldwide. This is a huge potential, I have to say, as a bibliometrician. And uh, here we can still discuss that. And But of course, we have to say, if you intend to do so, it must be, uh, it can never be error prone, but um, as Hank Mood says, what is the accepted error in our uh, countings? So you have to minimize uh, uncertainties at least. Okay. STP is both under and overestimating stuff uh, to some extent. We have seen, of course, it's underestimating because by nature, only publishing uh, academic stuff is uh, recognized. But on the other hand, of course, through to um, yeah, multiple uh, authorship uh, due to the fact that uh, uh, affiliation is not always employment. 
uh, it comes to a certain overestimation at the same time. So the standardization and assurance of commensurability remains a basic criterion for any measurement, and this applies also to STP. And of course, this is a personal comment by me. I mentioned already the um, crucial importance of uh, uh, looking at the profiles of the institutions because only like with like comparisons are reliable and uh, have a sense, so to speak. Um, we have different university profiles by structure, but also on basis on the uh, uh, research, on the fields of research in which they are active and in which they have their focus. So I have an example for, from an earlier study we have conducted when we have clustered European institutions, not so many, uh, and not only higher education, also research institutions. Um, and we had a set of uh, about 700 uh, institutions. The study was based on almost uh, 1,200 institutions. And um, we did that for the sciences. And I just want to share with uh, you this. It was an old study uh, about uh, 15 years ago. And um, you look, uh, you've, we found uh, different profiles. And uh, as a bibliometrician, I know that uh, um, in different fields, you have different standards concerning um, the publication output, citation patterns, but also uh, the stuff uh, needed and the resources needed for doing research. If you compare, for instance, humanities with many social sciences, with uh, medical sciences uh, or uh, uh, physics, yeah, high energy physics is an extreme, is an outlier, of course. Where, where uh, huge, uh, uh, large equipment is needed and huge, huge resources are needed, but it also to oncology or cardiology, I have some experience. I published with others, in um, with researchers in uh, these fields, and uh, the in, in terms of resources, we live in different dimensions as we live in social sciences and humanities. So we have to take uh, this into account if you would like to make. Uh, the entities comparable because there is no point in, in uh, comparing apples with, uh, with oranges, for instance. Uh, for instance, how to compare, for instance, a business school with a medical school. Um, so this is uh, these are things you have to consider whenever you quantify and you wish to compare uh, uh, higher educational institutions. So these are, for instance, you have, of course, a lot of uh, multidisciplinary, uni uh, multidisciplinary um, universities. The specialized medicine is uh, rather a, a matter for uh, um, institutions, not so much um, universities, but uh, the rest is uh, applies also to universities. And this is something we want, I wanted to share with you. We looked at countries and we looked at uh, the um, 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 the distribution of these eight clusters over uh, countries. And so you see that you have find different patterns, for instance, in, in Spain, as you find in, 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 in Belgium, for instance. So uh, this is also something you have to take into account whenever you apply your measures um, to effectual comparisons or even uh, to ranking. Yeah? So what coming back? Variables uh, used in university comparison are often not independent. That's also a point. If you look at the, all of these university ranking exercises, you find a lot of variables used, which are used in, um, as hybrid indicators or composite indicators. That means you have linear comp uh, compositions um, or linear com combinations of those. And um, one problem is that, that most indicators are not independent of each, of each other. And whenever you form, um, any kind of combination, linear combinations or something like that, uh, you, uh, this might impede the contra, contra, controllability of superposing effects. You have a superposition of, uh, of effects and you do not know to which extent this is due to uh, the interdependency of the variables. Huh? The extension of the STP measure to the global level, I mentioned, STP is based on a global multidisciplinary database. That means you can easily or readily extend it to the global level. But there's a challenge. The data pre-processing pre with name, with ambiguation, 
And here you are faced outside Europe, for instance, with the issues of uh, transcription of Asian names, um, uh, which uh, is um, uh, becomes ambiguous because uh, of uh, whenever, uh, for instance, the Japanese kanji or Chinese characters are transcripted to transcribed to uh, to Latin, then um, ambiguity uh, occurs. Um, and uh, you have to take uh, account to that. And it's known for all users of, uh, of uh, Scopus Web of Science that all these uh, uh, name rankings or other rankings are often not valid for uh, Asian names. But you have also problems in South America of this type. And the same applies to this ambiguation of institutional addresses. This is a challenge. Uh, and of course, you have to take into account, as already mentioned, the national peculiarities in organizational structures and university profiles. Finally, if I still have some time, no, probably not, but uh, there are some general issues that have been mentioned by Abraham Buxtein in 97 already, who noted three out of more demons to measurement in social sciences um, that are challenges to quantitative approaches. And that's randomness, fuzziness, and ambiguity. Randomness, there's a remedy, we can cope with that. Fuzziness can be solved in a way. Ambiguity is the most um, um, important challenge in this context. And you can feel uh, that uh, this might even bias studies sometimes in a, a systematic way. And finally, I would like to give this as a take home message to everybody maybe. I have taken that from Istvan Örkén. Uh, I, see, I see that we have also Hungarian uh, participants here, um, uh, who was a Hungarian writer. And this is taken from a more one minute stories. Um, has been published or, or originally in, uh, in 78 um, uh, as heavy industry folklore. It's a very sh uh, short story. It's unimpeded. It's called Unimpeded Production uh, Standards Hello, machine shop. Schultäti here. How much Schultäti? 33 comrade. What 33 Schultäti? What 33 comrade? Yes, what 33 Schultäti? Why? Wasn't 33 the right answer, comrade? The right answer to what Schultäti? To your question, comrade. Never mind Schultäti. Just resume um, where you left off. So sometimes there is the expression that uh, in bibliometrics and in counting uh, exercises, we are um, following the scheme and we certainly should not do so. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. I will not take much time to answer. Most of your um, remarks were very helpful and especially uh, the ones on directions to address potential problem for STP. And also I liked very much uh, uh, your suggestion to compare peer groups. This is something which could be done, uh, reducing the high variance and making more fine grained comparison uh, with less heterogeneity. I think it's helpful and can be done uh, by now. Uh, I would like first, could you stop sharing so that we, okay. I would like first uh, to give the word to Lutz, uh, if you have any comments or answer, you are more expert than me in bibliometrics, of course. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Benedetto, for presenting uh, our study. And uh, thank you to Wolfgang uh, for, for his comments. And uh, the comments were very um, interesting and uh, helpful uh, to improve um, our study or the, the, the indicator. For example, I think um, uh, the, the problem of the SCP indicator that there's a missing distinction between uh, part-time and uh, full-time uh, is, uh, is a very uh, important uh, disadvantage uh, of uh, the indicator. And the other problem of the SCP indicator that um, uh, authorship is uh, field uh, dependent, maybe this, this problem uh, can be tackled. Uh, uh, I th possibly think about uh, a field normalized uh, variant uh, of the STP indicator that uh, 
could um, that could be helpful here. Okay, thank you. I see Arlette was a question. Hello, everybody. Yes, I want to thank the authors for uh, this uh, important project of providing uh, size measures for higher education institutions. And I have a technical question regarding uh, the use of bibliometric measures for measuring the size of high ease. Uh, and it relates to the fact that some authors publish extendedly and it is known in bibliometrics that very many authors publish only once. And so I was thinking whether you might try to filter out, out authors who publish only once um, so you get a much reduced number of authors overall, or perhaps even another cutoff uh, could be useful, and restrict the size measure to authors that publish uh, over successive years. I cannot say at the moment what would be a good um, number of years, but perhaps that also might be a way to get closer to um, yeah, to academic personnel with a contract in a sense of or, um, capacity measure, really, because many authors are also uh, PhD students or have guest affiliations, as you mentioned. So my understanding that uh, introducing a cutoff would uh, increase the problems of comparing because you would start excluding uh, uh, people who are anyway employees of the institution. Um, I, I, I tend more to, to think that maybe they should be taking care of multiple affiliation because this should be visible in bibliometric databases. So it should be possible to understand when people at the same time are publishing in three different places. So I don't know, Lutz, uh, what involved in what you think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so you have addressed the question of transients, so-called transients. There are four types of authors. There are newcomers, terminators, transients, and continuants. Huh? And uh, transients are authors who are publishing one paper and then are disappearing from the scene, so to speak. Most notably, um, in the context of PhD work, um, PhD students, after getting their uh, taking their degree, they are leaving academia and are not uh, active in research anymore. Uh, but at least uh, they might be uh, PhD students and as such belong to academic personnel. The question of multiple uh, affiliation is, is really tricky. There are several models. Of course, there are others that uh, ha are affiliated with two institutions and that's correct. Uh, for instance, uh, Lutz Bormann can maybe uh, confirm that um, they are professors uh, at university and uh, directors of Max Planck institutions are also professors at university. So they have a double affiliation. Uh? Um, so, uh, but they are also double affiliations uh, caused by so-called honorific co-authorship, which is uh, not really a good uh, thing that um, um, uh, also the, the question uh, that arose already um, that there are universities outside Europe that hire others and pay for putting their address on uh, the byline of uh, the papers. So this is also a fact, and we have uh, scientists in Europe who are following this model. So multiple uh, authorship is really an issue uh, that has to be uh, looked at. And uh, even if uh, uh, the multiple uh, authorship is really justified, it does not tell us anything about the, the um, how can I say, the, uh, the um, yeah, um, how uh, the two uh, affiliation, what, what the, the time spent, uh, contractually spent uh, to work at the two um, uh, affiliations is. So this is again something around uh, uh, part-time uh, employment. Uh, that is only answering part of this problem. So it's, it's by far much more complex. Lutz, can you also add something? 
Um, yes, it, it, I think it might be possible uh, to um, uh, to to uh, uh, yes uh, to um, improve the indicator um, by um, focusing on uh, uh, by focusing on um, uh, on uh, on uh, on certain on certain authors. Uh, but uh, I think it, it will be uh, very difficult to find thresholds, uh, the right thresholds uh, for the for the for the focus. And uh, so, yeah, it might be very problematic to do, to do that. Thank you. I see Franz has a question. Yes. Um, thanks for the presentation, Benedetto, and uh, for the comments, Wolfgang. Um, I would like um, to question the the, the aim of. Um, of comparing these two measures, or rather of taking STP as a measure for organizational size of higher education institutions. I mean, I work at a Fachhochschule at a teaching oriented university, and it obviously does not represent well the size of our organization. Uh, I think that STP is, as an indicator, is, is better a better measure for measuring the research size of higher education institutions. And I would um, suggest rather to compare it with other measures that try to assess how much research is being done at higher in education institutions than aiming to, to measure overall size because not only teaching but also services to the community or, or services like uh, in, in, in medical faculties um, are, are not at all included in, in that publication-based um, indicator. Uh, I think that's this was exactly our conclusion. So the starting point is that uh, there are were some ideas uh, around that it's a convenient measure of uh, sites because of uh, prop good properties. Wolfgang mentioned that the fact that you can link directly to bibliometric databases, you can link to um, the avid for, for the whole world in one batch, etc. And then our conclusion was it's a good measure of the scientific potential. Uh, it correlates very highly, very highly with uh, sites, uh, conventional measures sites for research universities, but not for other institutions. So it's good if you compare scientific performance uh, in, in these terms, uh, is not good if you want to analyze the multiple activities of an institution and uh, compare the different portfolios. I think that's exactly what we, we came up. Uh, my tenet as a methodology is there is no perfect measure of anything. There are measures that can be used for specific purposes. I see Julia with a question or a comment. Uh, yes, thank you, Benedetto. I think it's really nice that you do this on a large scale European framework um, to analyze these kind of data because I assume that it's a uh... Yeah, very, very uh, complex in a way. Um, also, actually, I just want to stress what also Professor Glenza said in terms of um, university hospitals. Like I'm here in Ghent, and I know that at Scopus that there are different registers as part for the medical center or the hospital and for the university itself. So that's already, it adds a little bit more complexity. Um, and also um, the cluster specific thing. So like coming up with some weighted um, indicators I think that makes also sense like as you say now you looked into size and concluded that yeah you want to go into this next direction um and I also have a comment because you control for uh country fix effects but I also do wonder um yeah I don't know how but to keep track of because there might be also a lot of industry um collaborations yeah, and maybe it's also like these one-time things where the where you get the university gets private funding or the the, the research department, and um, then they do this one time, then they publish once on that specific topic. Topic, I don't know how or whether you could control for these, yeah, regional um, differences. Yeah, you might have regions where they do yeah, where you have these high tech or like big uh, uh, companies um, located, so that might impact it or not. I don't know whether it's out of scope, but yeah, it's just a question what to add, you know, like because country, yeah, but I think also like within country differences might also be interesting. Uh, on the last point, it's a good question. I have no firm answer. The main rationale, to be frank, uh, to control for country uh, using country dummies is organizational structures. 
So the fact that France is organized differently than Germany than Switzerland, and also different practices in um, uh, stat by statistical offices, to be frank with you, because we know that statistical offices collect it in different ways. Um, on whether we could uh, analyze uh, uh, more fine grained effect, I have no personal opinion. It might be a good idea, but. Yeah, maybe like like intensity of some industries. I don't know, like some indices which show whether you have like I don't know high competition or not, like herd bundle index. I don't know whether it it makes sense or not. It's just a question. My feeling this would make sense in a study of output. Yeah. But here we are comparing counts of uh, publishing people affiliated with university. Of course, uh, it, it might be the same indeed as uh, university hospitals that uh, cooperating with industry cre create a surplus of authors because some people are affiliated with university but are not contractual at the university, I would expect the effect is a smaller mm. because hospitals are really a giant effect. Yeah. I saw Wolfgang, you wanted to add something? Yes, if possible. I still had a question concerning the slide 11. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, it's interesting, it's plausible, so to speak, but I find uh, Germany and Austria on the low end at the right hand side. Eh? Uh, do you have an explanation for that? Or uh, it, it's a comment I made to myself that uh, uh, I have to look to these ratios more closely beyond the obvious cases of France. Eh? Um, because uh, some uh, parts could be, uh, I suspect that the Germany as two effects, one counting a lot of people from the hospital and second counting a lot of PhD students in academic personnel. But I have to look into the data more closely. Yeah, and uh, Austria and Germany are very similar here. Yes. So, yeah, okay, just a question because uh, this uh, struck me a bit unexpectedly. So, I have to cross check with the, uh, we have a detailed information on coverage of academic personnel by country from the OECD pilot. Okay. So I could look into it. I think this is the source of most of these differences. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I agree. Any other comments or questions? Seems that everybody is satisfied with what we discussed. So if not, uh, first I have to thank you a lot uh, and to thank especially Wolfgang for his generous uh, comments, which will help us to extend further the, the, our work. And then to thank uh, uh, Lutz as well for collaboration and uh, working together on this uh, very topical project. And then to thank Alessia from CNR for managing this uh, uh, research seminar series. And finally, to announce that, that the series continues. It's a series on monthly basis. Uh, next seminar will be 15 of February, same time. It will be about the gender and career progression in Europe, uh, using, as far as I remember, the more data. Uh, presented by Lucio Morettini from Senar in Rome, and we have a, this, as a discussion Marek Kwiek uh, from University of Poznan, a specialist of this kind of uh, uh, career issues. So I would like really uh, to see you again in this uh, very, very interesting conversation. If there are no other comments, uh, thank you and have a nice afternoon.